So thank you everyone for coming to Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. I am very excited today to introduce our speaker. It is Vinit Aurora. Um, so uh, Vinny is at the University of Chicago and is just a tremendous leader um, across the field of, of medicine um, and particularly within hospital medicine. She carries the title of the Herbert T. Alderson Professor of Medicine and then the other titles of being the Associate Chief Medical Officer for the Clinical Learning Environment and Assistant Dean for Scholarship and Discovery in the School of Medicine. And over the, the past 20 years, uh, Dr. Rory has just been a leader in the field in, in so many ways, uh, transitions of care, sleep, duty hours, all these things that have really shaped our field. She, she's really been sort of integral in them. I also wanna particularly mention the work that she's done around gender equity, because I think uh, her work in um, helping to advocate and, and lead in, in those regards and the research she's done has really changed, changed policy around many things that we've, we've done. She's a member of the National Academy of Medicine. She's been federally funded by all sorts of, of federal uh, institutes of, of, of health, um, as well as multiple foundations, including the Macy Foundation, which we'll mention. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to let her talk to us about the IGNITE program, which is what she's been working on most recently through her role as the Associate Chief Medical Officer of the Clinical Learning Environment, trying to improve our hospital systems for all of us. Dr. Aurora, take it away. Thank you. It's lovely to be here uh, with all of you. And uh, I'm just going to pause uh, to share my screen for a moment uh, to bring up my slides. And um, it's, uh, it's great to be here uh, with um, Alan at, at VCU. I'm actually from Maryland, so I know your area. I have not visited Maryland and my parents are there. They are vaccinated um, as well as my aunt and uncle. Um, I have a one-year-old uh, and a six-year-old, so we hope to be able to uh, road trip out there this summer. And so, um, so but I'm lovely, uh, lovely to be here with you virtually um, and especially visiting a place that I do know. So I'm especially eager to talk to you guys on April 1st, uh, and not April Fool's Day, although it is, uh, but it's also National Interprofessional Healthcare Month. And so uh, what fitting way to uh, to be able to spend the day with you guys talking about something that's near and dear to my heart, as well as Alan's heart. Um, and I think also your institution, given some of the investments that you've made or considering. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the IGNITE program, improving GME nursing and our professional team experiences, not just what it is and why we did it, but also how did we sustain and salvage during the pandemic stuff that we are actually doing as we speak. So some disclosures, this work has been funded by the ACGME through the Pursuing Excellence um, Initiative, as well as the Josiah Macy Foundation as a Macy Scholar. Um, so for the objectives, uh, we're going to discuss reasons to engage trainees and really all levels of learner and faculty in interprofessional clinical learning environments. We're going to identify mechanisms that engage these uh, folks into interprofessional clinical learning environments, as well as um, the talk that I'm giving most recently is how do you sustain and salvage during the pandemic, whatever it is, QI, yourself, um, your faculty career, um, your promotion, and this one is going to be about teaming. So I wanted to start off uh, by talking about the importance of um, interprofessional um, um, you know, healthcare, particularly in the concept of magnet recognition, the ACGME CLEAR program. So we have now accreditors that are really focusing on teamwork and how well teams work together. And I'll explain why that is in a moment, but we know that better teamwork leads to better outcomes. There's been pioneering work done by Judith Baggs, who's a nurse scientist at OHSU, looking at ICUs. There's a variety of other work out there. And I won't summarize all of that work, but just to say it all is there, but kind of pivot from there to say, how do you do it? Um, so the CLEAR program led by Dr. Kevin Weiss at ACGME visits institutions that are sponsoring institutions like VCU, like my own. Um, and the uh, role that I had and that I currently have is to help um, support that visit. And so uh, what they found in those clear visits where they're meeting with C-suite leaders and GME leaders to understand how residents, fellows, and faculty are integrated into the clinical learning environment are that they discovered four major themes that um, obviously we vary in the approach with which we engage residents and fellows in quality and safety. We vary in the way we do strategic planning. We vary in the extent to which we invest in training faculty 
and program directors in quality and safety. And then lastly, clinical learning environments vary in the degree to which they coordinate and implement educational resources across the healthcare professions. And I, I don't need to say that if you ask somebody how interprofessional care is at their institution, you're going to get a very different answer. And so um, Alan and I kind of work in these circles. And so I know that everybody's setup is very, very different. Um, from the nursing side, this is actually a key part of magnet recognition, magnet excellence from the American Nurses Credentialing Center that allows hospitals to um, indicate their organization is considered a magnet for retention, a place where nurses want to work. They have magnet hospitals have lower mortality rates, lower failure to rescue rates, lower nurse turnover and lower uh, vacancy rates, improved outcomes, higher satisfaction. And one of the key pieces of magnet is that nurses are involved in interprofessional collaborative practice within the care delivery system to ensure coordination and continuity. And so I am, and you know, even I don't even, I'm giving you these re reasons when in fact, all of you have had the experience of sort of visiting a doctor or being a caregiver um, likely, and you know how hard it is when people are not on the same page that you don't feel, um, that does not feel great. For those of you that work in undergraduate medical education, um, the AAMC, along with several others, have issued these interprofessional education collaborative team competencies, a few that I've excerpted here uh, from the IPEC collaborative clear roles, constructive reflection, um, and team communication, and so obviously really critical. Um, I was fortunate to be part of a group called N-Cycle, the National C Collaborative for Improving the Clinical Learning Environment. And here we are meeting in Chicago at the ACGME. I think I'm actually sitting right over here. And um, this was a really, um, you know, sometimes you attend conferences and although we haven't attended one recently, um, you attend conferences and they really change the way you think about things. And this is one of those conferences where they had a lot of this gallery style, um, you know, dancing with Mark debriefings. Uh, we were the faculty. So even though you have somebody here who's giving us a talk, there are these boards in the back, so a walking gallery, and then we were the ones who were going to lead our own discussion to reflect on the gallery. And we produced a white paper envisioning the optimal interprofessional clinical learning environment. And the white paper had several different pieces, recommendations for learners and for academic medical centers, for hospitals, and for patients. Uh, but I'm going to distill this down to this question, which is, um, as an implementation scientist, how do you implement this? You know, somebody gives you the stone tablets and then you're like, okay, now what? Um, and so with that, I'm gonna launch into the University of Chicago story, uh, which is which starts circa 2014. So this has been stuff that I've been doing for a long time in the background um, at my organization that's just coming to fruition. So these things do take time. And so it started with our, our first clear visit in 2014, where, um, you know, during the walk rounds, um, which is structured like a joint commission visit, so they do do a lot of walk rounds, um, our residents and fellows expressed a lot of excitement about the organization. But when they talked to the nurses, here's what the nurses said, nearly all nurses interviewed desired greater involvement with residents in quality projects. So we really had this sort of um, siloed system where the residents in some cases, the residents were working on a project and published on how to improve use of Foley catheters to reduce CAUTI um, and, um, you know, and showed great outcomes. And then a nurse in a different unit would submit a quality determination to say, I want to do something and hadn't even realized this other project took place. And so we were often connecting the dots being like, okay, this seems very inefficient to have all these metastatic quality improvement projects. Why are we not aligned together? Um, so what did we do? We, well, we went back to the basics and many of you know my basics is talking to the front line, just getting out there. And so we convened focus groups with 15 nurses and five residents from med surge units in spring of 2015. And we asked them, how are we going to do this? And um, everybody there said this is very important and in fact um the um one of the um surgery residents said this needs to start on day one when the residents ar arrive and the a nurse said there are residents and nurses who do this very well in our co professional collaborative practice so we need to recognize that so who are those um talking about those positive deviants that um sanjay saint from michigan and hand hygiene you know how do we actually improve hand hygiene by looking at the people who are doing it well so that led to um, really two different lines of work. And so the first is 
at orientation, when we think of the faculty that welcome our um, interns, our 131 interns at orientation, um, what we think of the big F faculty, you know, program directors, MD faculty, but what about people that are teaching our interns in real time at the point of care? Why aren't we involving our nurses? So we um, worked with our CNO to do that. And then the second project that I'm going to talk about is how do we recognize those positive deviants who can role model? Can they draw drive the improvement that we need in our organization so it's not top down and that's what the ignite program is that i'll mention so the interprofessional role play we give all of our incoming we invite nurse facilitators as well as patient experience facilitators to serve in these roles and we ask all of our um, interns to play the following interactive role play so the intern you're a senior resident tells you mr wilbur is stable for discharge the attending is expecting him to go home today your chief resident sends an email because the hospital needs to increase before noon discharges and if you're in urban um, south side of Chicago you'll get a surge alert saying that um, our hospital is full like we did today and you have not seen the patient yet this morning now you don't know what the other roles are so then the nurse this is her role or his um, today is your first day caring for mr wilbur the night nurse reported no major activities planned for today and that mr wilbur is high risk for falls due to his unsteady gait you do not see an order for pt so you plan to talk to the intern about it and then what about you what about being mr wilbur so our patient experience facilitators you mr wilbur have been hospitalized for three days you're feeling better but you're unsteady on your feet no one has has discussed going home you live alone and you're anxious about getting up in the stairs in your house and so this is sort of like a um, a low-tech version of a video game where the team that discharges the patient first wins uh, but of course one of the things we do right before we do the role play is we tell everyone well first of all don't share your role with people so it's literally like poker face and second is live into your role so really adopt this role and it's really impressive to see people really having this you know bitter like you know well my attending said i have to discharge you and the patient and the nurse are like no this patient can't go home yet so setting up that reality and so um we have seen over years that residents think this role play is realistic they're satisfied with it they're satisfied with the discussion and that they're going to be more thoughtful about their practice and um, they loved having nurses as part of the orientation. So that's been something that we've maintained for over five years. Uh, we also wanted to survey our nurse facilitators because this was the first time we're inviting them to co-teach with program directors. Is, is that good? And we uh, found the nurses were super engaged. They felt that um, they felt valued. Um, these were all very important to us. So, um, so that's just day one. So you can set the expectation on day one. And I'm showing you that because some people, when I get into the Ignite weeds, are going to be like, oh my God, I can't do that. That's way too much work. And that's why I say you got to start somewhere. So can you start with at least setting the stage, setting the culture early? It's very similar to patient safety. We talk about patient safety reporting from day one. And um, we might not be able to talk about it every day, but at least on day one, when people come to the organization, they feel it. So what about interprofessional collaboration and what is it unique about our institution? So interprofessional collaboration we know is associated with reduced medical errors, improved nurse and patient satisfaction, decreased inpatient mortality, shorter length of stay. It's a win. Um, however, in an urban hospital like ours, patients are not always localized. So we used to have geographic admitting, but what happens with geographic admitting, as many people will tell you, is that your hospital ER wait time gets longer. Um, and in a place when we're running 98% capacity and we have long ED wait times, that could be really deadly. And so we try to 80% 80, 80 of the time we try to geolocalize uh, with our bed logistics team, but we often have to break that. And so our patients are not localized. When I around on the units, I'm often walking three, you know, five flights of stairs, um, get a lot of good exercise at least. We also don't have a nursing school. And I mention this because our nurses are unionized. You know, we're a big uh, union town. And so whenever you're asking nurses to do something, even as simple as the orientation that I just showed you, that required CNO approval. You know, is it, who, which budget is it gonna come out of? What time is it gonna come out of? So even those small things, you have to start the discussion somewhere. 
So what we did was we launched a program called Ignite, um, Ignite Teams. And we thought what we would do is, how would we solve this? We would marry a residency program like internal medicine with the unit that they should be geographically located with most of the time. Um, and so residents would be nominated by nurses. It was structured like an award. Congratulations, you know, you're an Ignite champion. You've been selected by the nurses. And should you choose to accept this award, you're gonna work with us for two years on a quality improvement project. And you would serve alongside nurse managers and bedside nurses who had also been um, similarly selected either for their experience in magnet or because of a nomination by a resident. Um, the curriculum included excerpts from the ARC Team Steps program, which is a very famous team training program that focuses on the um, team leadership, um, situational monitoring, backup behavior, mutual support. We don't always have to do everything um, and communication, really the bedrock. And there were monthly coaching meetings uh, with myself and the other Ignite coaches. And um, from we also taught about QI and lean fundamentals using um, partnership with operational excellence and a focus on A3 and guided them towards project selection. We initially said that you can choose projects in any area. And initially we thought people in medicine might choose like a medical CHF project and surgery might choose surgical site infections. But we were really surprised to find out that every team chose to improve interprofessional collaboration. Uh, because that was what they perceived as the most important thing. And we didn't even say that they had to, but they chose to do it in different ways. So we had three cohorts. Um, this was the three years of the Pursuing Excellence Collaborative. Um, and so general medicine, pediatrics, and surgery, top line is the first cohort. Neurology, OBGYN, and orthopedics is the second cohort. And oncology, ENT, and urology are the third cohort. We were an inpatient. We had an outpatient Ignite team with orthopedics. We included, we specifically targeted areas from our press Ganey surveys where we knew we had um, areas that we could needed to improve in interprofessional collaboration based on what physicians and nurses said on the engagement survey, as well as on the patient HCAP survey. But our first year, we started with the programs that we thought would have the most buy-in. The program directors had bought in, um, the nursing managers had bought in. And so what were the projects? Well, in general medicine and oncology, even though they all chose to improve collaboration, it looked slightly different. And so in general medicine and oncology, they do not have um, um, rounds per se with the big teams with nurses on rounds because of this geographic problem, but they do have multidisciplinary rounds that occur every day. So what they chose to do was focus on improving team communication and understanding staff roles and interdisciplinary rounds. And I'll talk a little bit about an example there. Um, our pediatrics, um, surgery, neurology, and OB teams all had the same problem, which is they needed to have a nurse physician touch base. Patients were not getting discharged like they should. Um, they were often, when the time between a discharge order was put in and the discharge actually occurred was often more than three hours at our institution. And when our what our nurses often said is that if they knew earlier, they could prepare, they could have all of the after visit summary done, they could do the med teaching. But if they just got a surprise discharge order, then we would they wouldn't know and it would be very difficult. Um, and so this, this also sometimes resulted in huddles. And then in ortho, ortho, orthopedic surgery, ENT, and urology, all of our surgical fields, interestingly, all chose to improve patient education because one of the biggest um, burdens for them was the amount of education that needed to happen after a surgery. And so for orthopedics, just your activity restrictions, um, ENT, you get a new trach or a G-tube if you have had a neck cancer, how are you gonna care for it? Similar with uh, urology, what were you gonna do around Around your labs and that was actually an outpatient project as well which was um, understanding um, you know the need to get labs before you come uh, to discuss your risk for prostate cancer so what did our coaches do? Well, we supported the teams uh, with process and outcome measures. Our process measures, we worked with operational excellence. We have these MDI boards in every unit on our hospital and our clinic called Managing Daily Improvement Boards that are part of our Lean Kaizen work. And we uh, encouraged all the resident and nurse teams to add a measure onto the board to measure the process in real time that they were um, measuring. And then we also created custom scorecards through our data and analytics 
Sports Team Tableau scorecard to monitor service outcomes. And we didn't select service outcomes that were not measured by the institution. We made them select service outcomes that were already measured so that the build wasn't as bad and I wasn't going to be waiting a year for a, a measure out of our institution. So I'm just going to go through a few of the projects just so you get some examples and I will discuss medicine, obviously, given the audience, but um, because even in medicine, there's so many different ways to do this. Um, I wanted to share some examples. The first is pediatrics. I mentioned pediatrics because pediatrics actually chose to be an ignite team they called us they're like we want in on this program we're heard, heard you're doing it and i'm like okay and it turns out that they already had this strong culture of family-centered rounds and i know some of you might be med peds and know this um this is actually our attending um uh hospitalist dr barrett Frome on rounds uh pre pre-covid with all of her team i will show you a post-covid picture so please remember this um and what they wanted to do was add the nurse into rounds and and so um, what they decided to do is that they would ask the nurses to join rounds whenever rounds started on Comer 5, which was more a geographic based medical unit. Um, and the nurse would be asked to present the patient using a specific script. Now, initially, I should tell you this was multiple PDSAs because initially you're like, oh, just to have the nurse come to rounds. And of course, the nurse came to rounds. And what happened was the nurses were reporting that they were sitting waiting to talk about the uh, through discussing the 20th time of asthma differential for an intern. Um, and then when it came time for somebody to say, well, what do you feel, nurse? The nurse was just like, oh, you know, didn't see everything's, you know, they were too intimidated to speak because of the culture. So what we did was we worked with the nursing champions to create a um, script, concerns, assessment, uh, changes, lines, and monitors. We also flipped the script for the residents. So instead of the SOAP note, we used the APSO, Assessment Plan Subjective and Objective. And what this did was it allowed for the assessment and plan to go first. So the nurse went first, then the resident doing the assessment and plan, um, or the student. Then um, any questions, the nurse could peel off and continue with her day, and then subjective and objective. And so just highlighting multiple iterations to get that to work. So what did we see? We saw improved satisfaction um, with both um, physicians and nurses reporting satisfactions on the plan of care, as well as communication. Um, nurses reporting that they can express their concerns for patients during IGNITE rounds. Residents saying that they received less pages. Um, so if you think about the what's in it for me, re receiving less pages is a big deal and keep that in mind for later. And what did nurses say? Well, the format allowed nursing on the floor to be a presence. I have noticed family members are glad to see everyone together talking about their sick loved one. Sounds like rocket science when I tell other people, you know, what, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm getting nurses and physicians to talk to each other on rounds. And then even what uh, another nurse, sometimes the residents for my patient might actually come find me before rounds to ask me how things are going. So again, groundbreaking work, but really needed to happen. What happened with our patients? Well, Comer 5 is uh, one of our top performing units on the um, staff works well together on our HCAPS patient satisfaction data, uh, many years running, and it's because this project has been going on for so long um, to the point where in some months they re consistently reach 100%. Um, how do you know change is really sticking? You know when the new interns come and we ask every Ignite team to cement the best practice at orientation with the new interns. So um, when the new interns, this is Chris Matson, who's it's pictured in the front row is one of our Ignite champions, actually explained the project as a second year to his intern class. Um, he the other interns were like, well, what were you doing before? And that's when you know you have made a change because the other folks that you're worried about, whether it sticks, but the new folks are like, oh, you know, this, this, what, what were you possibly thinking before? Of course, we're going to buy in. So what about medicine? So internal medicine, um, meets every, we, um, used to meet every, uh, they still meet, they meet virtually now. So I'll tell you about that in a minute, but I did want to go through the actual, what we did. So we, uh, had a room, multidisciplinary rounds here. You can see everybody smiling. Um, that was not the way it was before people hated multidisciplinary rounds. Um, they thought it was a waste of time. The, the nurses and the case managers were like, it goes too long. It's routinely 90 minutes. The residents were like, oh, I have to go to multidisciplinary rounds, not understanding the value. 
Um, when we asked what why this was, it turns out that residents had no idea who anybody was at multidisciplinary rounds. They routinely described um, reporting out in multidisciplinary rounds, hoping somebody would grab an important piece of information um, and be like, oh, I'll help you with that. But they had no idea who to direct their questions to. And um, the staff routinely reported that the um, script that they were getting was like a uh, script for an attending. And they didn't need to be surprised with the diagnosis at the end of a long HPI. They just needed to know the issues that to prepare for discharge. And so um, what we did was we created these badge cards here. You can see um, um, these tent cards with people's name and their role and their pager number. And um, it, we and when the residents first saw this, they were so excited. They're like, can I have one? Um, and then we also created a badge card with the script that residents should use. So again, that scripting piece. And so here is the general medicine multidisciplinary reporting checklist. This project, again, when you're onto something, other people just adopt it at will. So already got transferred to oncology and hospital medicine. Medicine, adult hospital medicine started using a modified version of this because they also had the same problem with really long multidisciplinary rounds and not knowing who anybody did. And so this gets at the briefly who, the what, um, the overall plan, and what are the specific things to talk about at multidisciplinary rounds, including discharge barriers. Um, we also started measuring. So thinking about QI, data, 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 people respond to data. And so the data for multidisciplinary rounds that the residents responded to is that we did the, we did a survey that showed that, you know, uh, what we call this, uh, you know, illusion of superiority where the residents thought they were doing a great job presenting, but in fact, the staff did not think they were doing a great job presenting, but what's in it for them. It turns out that um, if you were late to multidisciplinary rounds, the time of your the total time your case manager was in multidisciplinary rounds went over 110 uh, up to 110 minutes and so we said if you're late to multidisciplinary rounds you're not going to get a patient placed at sniff that day uh, because your case manager is going to be now tied up waiting for the rest of the patients and this so this really cemented the instead of the you know it's the why why do you need to get to multidisciplinary rounds we also started measuring the time of the report outs and it turned out that after we implemented uh, the project with standard pager reminders, et cetera, we were able to shorten the time. Um, and so the percentage of multidisciplinary rounds that went above um, 60 minutes went way down after all of this implementation. And people felt a lot better about multidisciplinary rounds. And I'll show you some of the length of stay outcomes um, in a moment uh, after I show you all of the units. So general surgery. General surgery is an interesting uh, beast. Uh, this is our general surgery team, two residents in the middle here, an advanced practice provider wearing a white coat, and then two nurses um, on uh, the left side. And what general surgery um, often, their issue was that the residents rounded really early, 5, 6 a.m. They rounded before the day nurses got there. And then they had to go to the OR, because remember, being a general surgery resident, I know kind of could be a uh, long time since you did general surgery, their goal in life is to get to the OR. That's what you want. You want your residents to be learning surgery. And um, when they would get to the OR, then the day nurses would arrive and they would get paged constantly with different little things. And they had already been rounded and they were like, how come nobody knows anything? And so working with this team, they created a huddle with the night nurses, but how were the night nurses gonna know they were there? So in our, one of the nurses actually in our OB unit was like, you know, I don't know if you know, but there's a console in every room in the hospital. Um, and so when EVS, environmental services comes by, or when the food services comes by with a tray, they push the button and it links to our phone. And that's how we know that they're there. And I will admit, I have worked at this hospital for 20 years and I had never seen this before. Literally, it's, um, a, it's a clock, but when you touch the clock, this is what appears. And um, what we did was with clinical engineering, we added a button um, to the third floor, but we realized that you couldn't add it just to the third floor. It went live housewide. So what we did was like 
we got buy-in from all nurse managers to say, we're going to add this button, but we're only going to do this project on the third floor to look at outcomes. And then if it works, we'll expand. And that's exactly what we did. We taught the residents to, in the morning when they're rounding, to push the button MD in the room. It now says MD APP in the room to be more inclusive. And, um, and you can push it anytime, but especially in the morning. And then the night nurse will come and do a huddle. So the team presses the button when rounding, text the alert to the nurse phone. The nurse and providers can meet um, at the bedside or do a touch base in the hallway. Um, so this, again, really a simple maneuver, but really took some time to stick, but really transformed what people thought. So the residents thought that this definitely improved their care and improved their pages. And it also decreased paging volume. Again, looking at 15% um, reduction on acute care surgery, 14% on minimally invasive, 41% on surgical oncology. And so we have a surgery resident who's a business student who quantified this in terms of actual minutes saved. Um, and it's roughly around um, 60 minutes saved to which a program director is like, great, that's less time that you might be working in the hospital and improved resident satisfaction. So again, a win, a home run. Um, we compared it to um, the fourth floor where the residents worked and the nurses didn't, um, weren't pushing the button to see how this goes. We also saw improved clinical efficiency. So length of stay went down by over a day. Um, now, some of those changes were actually occurring through other reasons, but remember I told you about those three hours, right? So better nurse-physician communication definitely on the day of discharge, and even the day before, you actually might notice things. And you know, I will say, as somebody who who's participated in these huddles, the nurses often tell you the family is um, has this question, which they if you waited until day of discharge, you would never know that. Um, and then um, again, working with our business school student, a measure of efficiency or uh, for bed turnover, um, especially if your hospital is full, is we were able to um, have higher bed turnover, which means more access to care to take care of more patients. So um, with all of our units going live, I'm just showing you an example, we wanted to look to see how we did with teamwork and communication. And so we did that using the Press Ganey Clinician Engagement Survey, which measures both engagement and markers of burnout, as well as communication. There's two questions related to communication. There is effective teamwork between physicians and nurses at UChicago Medicine, and communication between physicians, nurses, and other medical personnel is good. And you can see all of the units in our hospital, and this is a year over your score difference, so a change score, and you can see that all the Ignite units moved up, um, and um, and that was pretty exciting to see that every Ignite unit moved up, except and none of the ones that moved down were Ignite units. Um, so with that, uh, we also um, being um, astute to um, as a role in the Chief Medical Officer Office, where I have a bridging leader between education and quality and clinical um, leadership. I'm always attuned to the metrics that matter for our CEOs and for our chief medical officers. And they really want to know, show me the money. What's the bottom line? And so we worked with our finance people. Um, and what we saw is in every unit that we worked, whether it was multidisciplinary rounds, the touch bases, uh, in neurology, we did a huddle um, at night. Uh, mother baby did something similar to the touch bases and in Hemonk it was multidisciplinary rounds. We looked at the mean length of stay before and after Ignite and we saw huge differences that we then translated into cost reductions um, and it would have been a savings of, uh, it, it translated into a savings of roughly three million dollars a quarter. Um, and this is of course using average, uh, we don't have actual costs, it's the um, assuming every patient is sort of an average patient um, admission. Um, and while we can't show direct causal relationships, it's funny when hospital leaders ask you this because you're like, usually, you know, um, we in hospital, you know, not everything is research grade decisions that we make, but sometimes when you show data, people do ask about that. But keep in mind, this was happening. Th there were a lot of things that the Ignite teams actually promoted. And so it might be, maybe it's not the huddle, but it was the fact that people were talking to each other more engaged, but be felt better about their jobs, um, as well as other work that was ongoing. 
And so what was some of the learning that was happening in um, Ignite at the time? Well, this was probably the most exciting to me is that um, when I think about high performance teams, you want to make sure people are understanding each other's roles as well as um, having a great understanding of communication. And so this was um, early on, we had a sociologist who worked with us, who she's doing her dissertation with us on physician nurse collaboration. And so she was doing some observations and here's one of her observations. And so um, getting residents and nurses in the room automatically increases shared understanding of roles. This is at the Ignite meeting. So this is an evaluation of what's happening at those Ignite meetings. So the residents mentioned that they will put the nurse manager in charge of the sheets. Leslie steps in, name is disguised, the nurse manager or the charge nurse. Paul and Tom don't know the difference. Leslie explains the charge nurse is in charge of the sheets. The nurse manager doesn't deal with that stuff. She's the CEO of the floor. They manage the budget, keep the lights on. Paul and Tom are laughing, shows how ignorant I am. Well, that's one of the side products of Ignite. We learn more about each other's roles. Um, and then similarly, the residents and nurses got in the same room and understood QI knowledge um, that each other is were participating. Nurse Clara says we could use the MDI boards to keep track of how well we are doing. Paul and Tom look at each other and ask, what is an MDI board? Maria pulls up a photo of an MDI board uh, board on her phone and shows it to Paul and Tom. Oh, those, says Paul, who's the resident. I've always seen those around, but I've never understood what they were. And so highlighting that, you know, we do a lot of things in our hospital that not, are not necessarily connected to the learning for the residents and the faculty. And so how do you do that better? I should say that, um, we now have a hospitalist Ignite team, so it's not just for residents. I mean, this is everybody needs this. And we have faculty champions on each of our Ignite teams who've been trained. Um, so it's not just me who's a coach. So I have a peds coach and an OB coach, um, a neurology coach. Many of them have been trained either in performance improvement or in um, operational excellence. Um, so now I'm going to shift gears um, and talk about the salvage. So um, now imagine we're in COVID pandemic. We still are in the COVID pandemic. And how are we going to salvage this? And I will tell you, um, obviously, I don't need to remind you a year ago it was a dark time for all of us, right? We didn't know what was happening. A lot, anyone who was doing a QI project was probably like, okay, well, there goes that. And similarly, that was what we thought. And, and it was survival. It was like, just survive. Make sure you've got your PPE on. We're in it together. Um, but we weren't actually like, oh, touch base with your nurse. Go track down your nurse. And certainly not have both of you enter the room together. Because remember, at the very end of that, uh, at the very beginning of the pandemic, the thing we needed to preserve most was our staff so we could care for patients. And the thing we wanted to make sure was that our staff stayed well. And so, um, so what did we do? So in July, we were welcoming new interns. Our numbers had gotten better. And our, our, our Ignite program was in shambles. We, had, we were like, what do we do? So we decided that we needed to do a massive reignite and a relaunch. And instead of launching in different ways in different units, that was going to be too hard. We didn't have the grant anymore. We needed to, what did we learn from the grant that we could sustain the best practice? And so with that best practice, we could say, we want everyone all in to go in on this. And we chose to rally around that button in the room and do the touch bases for every single unit. Um, and we highlighted, you know, nurses are in the most trusted profession in the U.S. 19 years in a row, and we are in this, um, you know, um, you know, um, major movement of distrust right now of the healthcare system. Um, and so, how how are we going to partner together? We need to be on the same page. Uh, improved teamwork is even more essential during the pandemic, given the issues of hospital capacity. You every hour you keep a patient in longer, that's that's a potential COVID patient coming in that we don't have room for. Um, as well as patient illness, a lot of patients have pushed off their care, and so it's not you know I don't know about you, but I'm seeing people come in with A1 sees new diabetics 14. Um, I've saw, I've seen young people come in with EFs of 10%. And you're like, how did this happen? And you're like, probably they never made it to clinic for their, you know, they were okay, kind of um, not really doing a lot at home because they were kind of, you know, everyone was home and now they're really coming in. And it was harder for physicians and nurses to touch base because of the social distancing in the hospital. So one of the things that happened with Ignite is that 
um, instead of pushing the button, people started doing touch bases because the nurses would see the physicians and they knew they were invited. And so the nurses would just grab them or do a touch base afterwards. And so we, we, we saw a plateau in the button pushes, but we saw that people were doing touch bases. Um, with, with the COVID pandemic, we saw that it was harder to do that because you would not see the resident or the faculty. People were rounding separately. As a hospitalist, I'm rounding alone often on a teaching service. Um, and so it was also harder to recognize people with PPE and very hard as uh, we were welcoming new interns, how would they um, have that um, teamwork and, you know, facial recognition. So we launched, relaunched the MD APP in the room button, uh, where we asked physicians and APPs to push the button. We asked uh, nurses to see the alert, obviously, and then do a socially distanced touch base in the hallway. Um, and we went live with this. Um, in July. And so here is actually right there in the middle is where we went live in July. You can see the big uptick. So um, the the bottom where we bottomed out is the pandemic. That is March um, 16th shelter in place, a big catastrophic da downward until we relaunched um, when the new interns arrived. Um, we dipped again, and that corresponds to our November surge, our um, our fall our fall surge, um, and then we shot back up. We were like, we got to do this. You know, we put all of our effort into a relaunch again uh, with more champions, um, and we uh, we got we we got a big uh, uptick. And you can see that we did. Um, you know, over the holidays it came back down again, um, and then it's starting to steadily increase. And I've seen this with so many QI projects. It takes a few cycles of big. Um, upticks and then it starts to steadily increase and this has translated into um, and I should also tell you that we are seeing you know when I was on service recently people are touch basing without pushing the button because they're seeing you beforehand which is exciting to see so we're actually going live housewide today with a board metric in the MDI board metric which is did you have a touch base today um, and then we also look at our patient experience does our team work well together and this is a, over the pandemic over the course of the pandemic and we now see that almost all of our units are in the green and I don't need to show you that we had a lot of red units early on and so we do believe that this is working. Um, so I do want to end with um, um, how do you salvage rounding, um, since I think that's a very important concept um, for education and clinical care. And so let's go back to pediatrics, which has those family centered rounds. Um, this was perplexing to them, which is how do they do this in the focus of the pandemic. And so uh, what they did was um, they actually worked on a um, on a system called Leapfrog, and um, here you can see this is the patient's um, um, caregiver with consent to be photographed um, that is outside, and there's a little red uh, line on the um, under the doorway. So they place that line to be like you can stand over there, don't come out. Um, you've got a nurse, you've got a medical student presenting the case, um, you've got a nurse, and the attending is taking the picture, um, and in the middle is an um, is a is an IV pole with an iPad hanging and a clip and a speaker that's mounted. And I should say very specifically multiple iterations of PDSA to be like which speaker, which clip will work on an iPad. And this is that Comer 5 unit where they're dragging the iPad. And on that iPad is all the other learners and case managers and social workers and child life psychologists that nutritionists that need to be present. And I'm, I highlight this because this is the future which is maybe we are going to visit patients, but maybe some of us are leapfrogging in. And when this medical student is done, he's a third year and he gets the experience of presenting to the attending and to a team, he pushes back he goes back and leap and and um, to the medical student area and another medical student leapfrogs into the next patient. So every learner gets that experience, but every learner is also on the background um, listening. And we're now working with our preclinical students because, of course, all those shadowing experiences completely fell to the wayside to say, you know, maybe on Saturday you can just zoom into medicine round. So we're going to try that and get the experience. Um, and you don't need to necessarily be in the hospital. Um, and if we can do that, you can imagine there's a lot that we can do virtually that would improve uh, learning. And so um, I should mention there's a ton that we did in the telemedicine space and the outpatient side. But I mentioned this in the inpatient side because I think this is actually a very 
interesting thing to also think about in terms of when we go back to the normal, the new normal, what is it fair to a patient to bring in 20 people? What do what is sane to actually do? And so these some of these hybrid models make a lot of sense to me. Um, and so just highlighting if you're interested at all in the equipment, I can send you uh, what the equipment uh, was that that led to this. Um, and then of course, important to study. And so this is um, when pediatrics went to all Zoom rounds, where it was just attendings, everybody was on Zoom, and then everyone rounded separately, you can see huge um, declines, huge, lo very low numbers out of scale of five on Zoom rounds. Quality of pediatric hospital medicine rotation for our students, 2.7. Uh, but with the leapfrog rounds, a huge improvement across the board. Um, and so we believe that this is about salvage, salvaging learning and care um, during the pandemic. Um, and so with that, um, I want to leave you with the fact that the IGNITE model, I believe, uh, enables that co-creation of performance improvement projects with interprofessional teams and models high performance teams. You're, you are learning about teaming. Um, and some lessons that I've learned along the way, co-create the project with those that do the work. I would not be here were, were it not for all of the people that are doing the hard work today and every day. Don't underestimate the power of scripting and coaching. So it's not just getting people in the same room, but you actually have to tease out and say, well, let's work on the script and then teach people how to communicate. Build in the backup behavior. A common question I'm asked is, how did the residents and nurses have time to do this? And so remember, for the leadership um, calls, which are all on Zoom, we now meet every uh, twice a, a month, we um, say, just send one member of your team. You can work on your project outside of that, but just send one member of your team. And so uh, despite the initial onboarding, then it's just who is the team leader. And each, uh, because of the way the teams are structured, sometimes the nurse takes the lead, sometimes the resident takes the lead. Um, different residents take the lead at different times, but they do handoffs with each other. So when somebody's in the ICU, somebody else is taking the lead. Allow those flexible models of leadership. And then data and documenting ROI really matter. And so this is a coachable skill. You have to let people know you've got to measure what matters and you have to tell people what you're measuring. Um, and so with that, I have a ton of people to thank, um, including the funders of these of the work. But I especially want to call out our Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education and our DIO, Dr. Anita Blanchard, who is a huge fan of all of this work um, and has made this happen, as well as the GME team um, and also um, Alicia Co, Stephen Weber, and Debbie Albert, our former Chief Nursing Officer. So with that, I will um, stop sharing my screen and I'm happy to take questions, Alan. Great, yeah, so if anybody has questions, you can put them in the chat or I will uh, try to, to ask them. Um, you can maybe even speak out. So, um, but Vinny, let me, let me start with this. So um, how important is it to do the right thing versus just do something? Because we often talk about sort of perfect being the enemy of good. And I'm, I'm wondering in your experience with doing all of these different kinds of things, how you, you think about that um, sort of how we balance those things. So I'm going to be really honest, which is that um, there's a reason that I have not published on Ignite, which is that it's messy. This work is messy and it's not, it's somewhat unforgiving at that publication stage, but all of our residents have and nurses have had quality improvement posters presented at our internal day and externally and have gotten a lot of recognition from various groups. Um, and so um, so for for faculty, it's the key is remember is this you have to do something. You have to start somewhere and do something. And so bite off whatever you can start small. Um, for us, that central organization really helped. I often um, I would say as the coach, the faculty coaches are like balancing what is interesting to the residents and nurses and what's feasible. And so that's really where you're trying to, because you need a win. If people do not feel like they can get a win in a year, it's not going to work. And so I often break up the year into quarters and say, in the first three months, you choose your project. In the next three months, you implement your project. And then the following three months, you um, evaluate your project. And if you fall off that grid during those meetings, then we're going to try to work with you to figure out, well, what can you salvage? A lot of times, residents and nurses have super high standards for themselves. They're like, you know, I, I have an ENT resident who was like, well, our project fell apart during the pandemic and, you know, I don't have anything. And when you dig in, you're like, 
we've got tons of nurses who are doing trach education and they actually are recording it and the patients feel better about it. It's more the feeling that the project fell apart, but in fact, some parts of this project sustained and even during the pandemic, highlighting what sustained is really important. Um, and so, um, you know, I've been looking at some recent data also from our medical students. I didn't mention some of the IPE work with our medical students, but like we had been on an upward trajectory implementing a lot through the AMA consortium. Every year our students were really feeling very good about IPE. And then in the pandemic year that just graduated, it, it dropped because we couldn't do a lot of that, you know, for their fourth year, but it didn't drop to the extent that it started in 2016. And so that made me feel better, which was like, okay, there is a pandemic drop, but we can don't forget to salvage. And and it's um and I would also say sometimes people over focus on the on the outcome and it's the story. Tell the story. Even if it fails, it's an important story. And so um so these are all important things that hopefully can help help all of you. Yeah this this concept of salvage is um fascinating. Um and I had th thought about that before. There's a question from Michelle Brooks, who's one of our hospitalists, and I think you two have met, met each other before. Hi, um, yeah, she, she asked about um, maintaining morale, which which you sort of were starting to get to. And so, um, so what is the secret to maintaining morale when people sort of feel like they're not having success or they're in the midst of the pandemic? How, how did you work towards that? We lowered the bar, and so I, during the pandemic, we we um, so during March through June, we did not have ignite meetings. I do want to be very transparent about that. Um, part, there are many reasons for that. One is that everybody was clinically deployed and it pulled in a lot of different directions, and we thought this was not the time to focus. And what we did was we. Um, used our list host to encourage people to attend other meetings, like meetings to huddle to address burnout that GME was offering, um, nursing issues around uh, burnout. So there were a lot of other things going on at the time that needed to be addressed. And so we did not want to add to that, um, to that, you know, chaos. Um, we relaunched the meeting in, um, in May, I believe. In May, we relaunched the Ignite meeting. And we said that, um, you know, just come to the meeting and tell us how you're doing. No minutes. It was like, just come to the meeting. We're going to do a touch base. We were all going to do a touch base with each other. How are we doing? What are we seeing? How, what is the new normal? That was the topic of the meeting. So as opposed to the formal minutes and data, we showed no data. We just went around the, the room in Zoom and asked everybody to tell us what they were seeing and feeling. And we had really high attendance. And in fact, in the Zoom world, we have higher attendance at Ignite meetings than we did before. So that's one of those salvage pieces, right? Which is the residents can all of a sudden come to the meeting. Um, and, it's, and even if they come for 10 minutes from clinic, they feel connected. Um, and what we realized is that there was a um, there was a value to the meeting. There was a value to seeing people from other fields um, talking about their experiences. So those first few meetings were just kind of support and um, plugging people in and saying, you know, here are the events. Here are some of the things you can do, um, and sharing concepts like what was what were you doing in urology versus what were you doing in neurology. Was there something that we could learn from? Um, and then um, when we could, when we relaunched, it was getting the buy-in and saying, um, when you know, when the teams. I remember one of the teams was like, "I just don't know that we can do this." And I was like, "You know what? We're only going to do one thing this year. We're all going to work on this one thing." And they were like, "Okay, that seems great." Um, and then you know, we were like, "We're you know, one of uh, one of the surgery residents was like, you know what? I'll prepare the tip sheet." and everybody can use it. So then instead of the teams being small mini teams doing their own thing, it's a mega team and the mega team is all pushing all in the same way. So the alignment is very powerful, especially right now to say you're part of a big team. And so um, so that's what I think has been the secret to our success. So you have a commendation and a thank you from Peter Buckley, who's our Dean. So thank you, Dean Buckley, for being here. And uh, Benino, that he very much appreciated your presentation. Um, Georgia McIntosh, one of our other hospice leaders, uh, has a, a question about how you get uh, learners, residents, and, and students to, to think about concepts like length of stay that are not things that they necessarily are excited about and, and see as you know reasons to be in medicine. That is a great question, and I will say that um, this is a lot about it. A lot of this is about. Um, 
the vocabulary. So length of stay is a is you know I attend a lot of access and capacity meetings about length of stay as I'm sure you probably do too. Um, that's not going to be something that really drives interest in the medical education community. But if you change it and say access to care for our community, like length of stay, if you're a, a hospital that runs at 98 to 99 percent capacity, is an ED access issue. And so we literally um, have gone through the calculus to say if we uh, reduce length of stay by several hours, that's X number more patients seen per month that you we would be able to serve our community. That matters. Clinicians can get behind that. The other thing that um, people can get behind, again, that's why we measure paging. We measure the ease of practice, the well-being measures, because if we're all doing better, then we should feel like we're doing better as well. Um, and similarly, um, uh, you know, readmission. People, it's hard for people to get behind something like readmission. But when we talk about one path to, re, to avoiding readmission is getting people primary care appointments in seven to 14 days, and we measure that, people can get behind that. They're like, I want, because everyone knows the struggle of getting a, a patient at an appointment and that really bad feeling when you're discharging somebody into the ether without great follow up on a, like a Saturday or Sunday. If you solve that as part of readmissions, people will be like, you know what, I'm definitely going to double down on that. And it solves readmissions. So the key is finding the words that matter most to the constituents that you're talking to. And so oftentimes I will say that's where the bridging leaders comes in. Comes in. So when I'm, I'm on the GME committee agenda every uh, month, uh, every other month, and I I routinely say when I have an ask, for example, when I ask, I have an ask about phlebotomy, I make the ask about high value care. I say, well, we all know this is about high value care, et cetera. When I have that, when I, when I have to, the ask to go to, um, you know, the hospital, I don't say necessarily QI, systems based practice, <laughs> high value care. I say something like, um, we know that phlebotomy is overwhelmed and the time to get a lab, et cetera. And this is about reducing, reduce, you know, improving uh, turnaround time. That's the word that they care about, turnaround time of the lab test. And so it's about what is that measure that they're measuring? And obviously medical educators are measuring very different things. And so if you can get that program director competency checkbox checked and a hospital leader checked, then you're in good shape. And that's what I sometimes really think very carefully about the messaging so that it that it matters to the group that I'm talking to. That's a, that's a great leadership lesson there. Um, so let's wrap up with this question from our GME Dean, Brian Aboff, also our DIO. Um, so he asked with residents uh, fluctuating schedules where they're you know, inpatient, outpatient, ICU all over the place, how do you get continuity um, across these projects as they're trying to, to move things forward with the nursing staff? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Thanks for the question, Brian. I would say that one of the things we've been very successful with is engaging the program director to ask them this question. So I wouldn't know from orthopedic surgery, how do we get continuity? But our orthopedic surgery program director said, we would like for our team to have one resident from each year. So we literally have one resident from each year and they pass off the project. So that's five years, you know? Um, and then in surgery, they're like, you know what? We have those built-in dedicated research years, those will be the captains and then they'll engage the others that are on the quality committee. Um, and so what we end up happening is that each we now say to the residents, like, you know, what, whatever the structure is, you just supply the residents, we will do the coaching. Um, and that has ended up working out. So the structure of the team varies on each discipline based on who is um, most available. Um, and oftentimes it ends up being like, you know, um, either somebody who's on a lighter rotation or a kind of like the ortho model where there's in medicine, for example, it's two in, two interns, two, two juniors and two seniors that kind of drive the ship. Great. Well, thank you so much for all of your hard work and wisdom and, and inspiration. It, it's great to have you come speak with us. It's lovely to be here and uh, good luck. And I hope to be able to see you all at a conference sometime in the next uh, two years. So thank you.